I tell you, Percy, it's more than flesh and blood can stand. I won't put up with it one more day, and that's that. Now, take it easy, old girl. You're letting yourself get upset all for nothing. Nothing? Is it nothing when me nerves is in shreds, listening to them footsteps overhead day after day? It's only the new lodger walking about upstairs. I know who it is, don't I? But what's he doing it for? Tell me that. Backwards and forwards all day long, like a caged animal. That man's up to something, Percy. I know he is. And you got to put a stop to it. You're being a bit odd on the poor chap, Mabel. Well, he's quiet enough now, ain't he? Not a sound out of him. Oh, yes. He's gone to bed now. It's always the same this time of night. But he's on the go all day when you're out at work. And he's driving me, poor me. Be reasonable. There's no law against a chap walking about, is there? It's not as if he's doing you any harm. Shh. Do you hear that? He's off again. Well, maybe he is, but it's no Go reason. Go up and tell him he's got to stop, Percy. Show him who's master in this house and say you won't stand for it no more. Well, what are you waiting for? Well, I, I just can't... Here yeah, now, he's gone back to bed. <laughs> I can't very well tell him to stop when he's stopped already, can I? <laughs> oh, I might have known you'd wriggle out of it. All right. If you're not going to do nothing, I know someone as will. What do you mean? Who? Mr Sherlock Holmes. That's who. First thing tomorrow morning, I'm going straight to Baker Street. The Red Circle by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Dramatised for radio by Peter Ling With Clive Merrison as Sherlock Holmes and Michael Williams as Dr John Watson and featuring Joan Sims as Mrs Warren and Ronald Herdman as Inspector Gregson The Red Circle You must try to understand, Mrs... Uh, uh, Warren, sir. Same as the street. It's easy to remember. Ah, yes. Quite a coincidence, Mrs Warren. You actually reside in Warren Street, do you? Oh, no, sir. We live in Great Orme Street, near the British Museum. But we're not far from Warren Street. Ah, uh, quite. Mrs Warren, you must appreciate that Mr Holmes is a very busy man. All right, my dear chap, leave this to me. Uh, in all honesty, my dear lady, I cannot see that you have any real cause for uneasiness. That's right, and since Mr Holmes has a great many calls upon his time... I hope you'll forgive me. I do have a certain amount of work on hand. Watson, would you be kind enough to... Um... Yes, of course. Allow me, Mrs Warren, this way. Uh, that's easy enough to say, Mr Holmes, but if I didn't have no cause for uneasiness, I wouldn't be here now, would I? I'm worried sick, and that's the truth. And I keep remembering our Mr Hobbs. Mr Hobbs? Mr Fairdale Hobbs. He lodged with us last year. You helped him out when he had his bit of trouble with the law. Fairdale Hobbs, the purloined paperweight. Ah, the bank clerk. Oh, it's quite a simple matter, as I recall. Oh, simple to you, perhaps. But he never stopped talking about it. About your kindness, Mr Holmes, and the way you saved him from jail. He said you brought light into his darkness. Yes, I'm sure. Thank you, Mrs. Warren. So when I was suffering terrible doubt and darkness myself, I thought of you, sir. And I know you could help me if you would. Uh, yes. Uh, well, perhaps you'd care to take a seat, madam. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, let us consider this matter a little further. You don't object to tobacco, I hope. Oh, I'm used to it, sir. Mr. Warren smokes a pipe. Just like you. I see. Now, where are the matches? Matches? Oh, here you go. Now, <clears throat> as I understand it, you're uneasy because your new lodger remains in his rooms all day and you never see him. I dare say if Mr Holmes were your lodger, he wouldn't see him for weeks on end sometimes. Oh, begging your pardon, sir. This is different. It frightens me, Mr Holmes. I can't sleep at night for lying awake thinking about it. It's all right for Mr Warren, he's out at work all day. But I'm alone in the house with that man and I want to know what he's up to. What's he done? 
What's he hiding for? I tell you, it's driving me off me head with worry. Now try to relax, dear lady. Now sit back in the chair. No, no. Right back. Now rest your head upon that cushion. And let us consider the situation calmly and peacefully. Now take your time. Try to remember everything you can about this man. Even the smallest detail may be essential. Huh? Good. Now, to begin at the beginning. He arrived when? Ten days ago, sir. And he paid me a fortnight's board and lodging in advance. Uh, those are the usual terms, I take it? Hmm? Yes, sir. The usual terms is 50 bob a week all in. He's got the small sitting room and bedroom on the first floor, self-contained, as you might say, right above my kitchen. More's the pity. Oh, I must say that seems very reasonable. Fifty shillings a week. Uh, yes, sir. Only he says to me, I'll pay you five pounds a week, he says, if I can have it on my own terms. Five pounds? Mm. What did he mean by his own terms? He was to have a key of the house. Well, that's fair enough. Our lodgers generally do. And he was to be left entirely to himself, never to be disturbed, not on any account. Well, there's nothing so very extraordinary in that, surely? Well, not within reason, no, sir. But this is beyond any kind of reason. He's been there now for ten days, and neither me nor Mr Warren has set eyes on him. And except for the very first night, he's never once gone out of the house. Ah, he left the house that night, did he? Yes, sir and come back very late after we'd gone to bed. He told me when he took the rooms that he'd probably be late and asked me not to bolt the front door. It was after midnight when I heard him come in. What about his meals? I presume he must eat occasionally. Well, that's something else he was very firm about. Meal times he always rings his bell, then I have to leave the tray on a chair outside his door. He rings again when he's finished, and I take it down the same way. If he wants anything else, he prints it on a scrap of paper and leaves it on the tray. How do you mean, he prints it? Well, he prints it in big letters, not joined up writing. Just the word for whatever he wants. Look, I bought some with me to show you. Soap, do you see? Hmm. Here's one. Match. This one he left for me the first morning. Daily Gazette. I leave it with his breakfast every day. This is certainly a little unusual. Seclusion, I can understand. But why print? Why not write? Printing is a slow, clumsy process. <laughs> uh, what does it suggest to you, Watson? Perhaps he wants to conceal his handwriting. Yes, that's fairly obvious, but, but, but why? What may it matter to him that his landlady should not see his handwriting? And why such laconic messages? Uh, I can't imagine. Well, it opens up a pleasing field for speculation. You notice that the, the words are written with a coloured pencil, mm -hmm. violet tinted, and the edge of the paper has been torn on one side after the message was written, so the S of soap is partly missing. And that suggests caution, don't you think? Caution? I'd call it carelessness. No, 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 no. The paper's been torn quite deliberately. There's probably some mark. Yes, a fingerprint, perhaps, which might have given a clue to the writer's identity. Not to me. I don't know that much about fingerprints. Oh, uh, no. Tell me, Mrs Warren, you described your lodger as of medium height, dark and bearded. What age would you put him at? Uh, youngish, sir. Not above 30. Mm, nothing more you can tell me about him? Uh, let me see. He's well-dressed, quite the gentleman, and he spoke very good English for a foreigner. Oh, he's a foreigner? He never mentioned that. Where's he come from, do you know? Oh, he didn't say, and I didn't like to pry. Abroad, I should think. Yes, abroad, definitely. Yes, and he never gave you his name? No, sir. Uh, has he received any letters since he arrived? Many callers? No, sir. None. Yes, but I... Uh, I still don't understand. Surely you must see him when you go to his room to make the bed and so on. No, sir. He looks after himself. He was very strict about that. Good Lord. Certainly remarkable. Now, what about his luggage? He brought one big Gladstone bag with him. Nothing else. Whoever he is, the gentleman has not gone out of his way to be helpful. Uh, does he ever send anything down from his room apart from crockery and messages? Does he leave and nothing else on the tray? Oh, bits of rubbish sometimes. The Gazette after he's done with it. Oh, uh, this was on his tray one morning. I didn't know if it might be important. Hmm. It's just a crumpled scrap of paper. Uh, turn it over, Watson. Ah, a red circle. 
Does that mean anything? Yes, it might. What else do you have in that envelope, Mrs Warren? Oh, I hope you don't mind. It's, it's only two burnt matches and a cigarette end. I bought them with me because Mr Elb said as you could read a lot out of little things. Yes, thank you. Yeah. But not in this instance, I fear. The matches have been used to light cigarettes. That's clear from the shortness of the burnt ends. It takes half a match, at least a light a pipe or a cigar. But there's something rather remarkable about this cigarette. You did say the gentleman had a beard, a beard and a moustache. Yes, sir. Ah, very odd. Now, I should say this cigarette could only have been smoked by a clean-shaven man. The stub is very short. And look here, Watson. Mm -hmm. Even your modest moustache would have been singed by it. He might smoke through a cigarette holder. No, I think not. The end's been matted by the lips. I suppose there couldn't be two people in your first-floor rooms. Oh, no, sir. As it is, he eats so little, I wonder at it. Just pecks at his food, he does. Well... It is an interesting puzzle. Well, I fear we must wait until you can give us a little more information. In the meantime, I don't think you've much to worry about. You've been well paid, and though your lodger is certainly eccentric, he's not giving you any trouble. If he chooses to lie low, well, it's nobody's business but his own. Oh, sir, you mean to say you won't do nothing? I have no fear. I have taken up this matter, and I won't lose sight of it. Return immediately if anything fresh occurs. If you need me... I shall be at your service. Oh, thank you, sir. And you too, sir. Oh, don't mention it. Allow me to see you out. Well, Watson? I took her to the corner and she caught a bus to Bloomsbury. We talked a little more, but... Nothing new emerged. Uh, so, have you reached any conclusions about this intriguing riddle? Any theories? Well, there's certainly some points of interest. I must say, it all strikes me as pretty trivial. Most well, possibly. We may be dealing with a, an individual who has a reclusive personality and an obsessive character. On the other hand, the truth may lie deeper. I say, Holmes, had it occurred to you that the lodger at Great Orme Street may not be the same man Mrs Warren met originally? My dear chap, you take the words out of my mouth. Mm. How did you reach that conclusion? I suppose it was a cigarette end, really. Chap with a beard couldn't have smoked it. Quite so. And any other reason uh, apart from that? Well, he went out immediately after he'd taken the room and came back very late that night when nobody was about. Someone else could have taken his place. Mm, yes, yes, and don't overlook the fact that the man who paid the rent in advance spoke English well, whereas the one who printed those little notes used the words match when it should have been matches. Oh, yes, yes. There is that, of course. Yes, I imagine the word was taken from a dictionary, which would give the noun in the singular, not the plural. The terseness of the notes might conceal the lack of fluency in English. Yes, but having said all that, what's the point of it? Why should one man book the room and another one move in? Yes, well, therein lies our problem. Mm, but we have one obvious line of investigation. While you were escorting Mrs Warren, I was studying a personal column in today's Daily Gazette. Luckily, we need only concern ourselves with one particular newspaper. Personal column? It's an exhaustive catalogue of groans, cries and grievances, an invaluable hunting ground for students of human nature. Now, we know the gentleman in question is alone, without callers or correspondence. How else is he to receive messages from the outside world, hmm? Now, cast your eye over these creed de coeur, Watson, and tell me if anything strikes you. Um, a lady with a black feather boa at Prince's Skating Club. Mm, I think we might <laughs> pass over that one. Surely Jimmy will not break his mother's heart. Touching but irrelevant. Uh, if the lady who fainted on the Brixton omnibus... No, 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 this one. Look here. High red house with white stone facing, third floor, second window left, tonight, G. Huh? Well, Watson, what do you suppose that means? Mm, to me, nothing whatever. Uh, but it might mean a great deal to Mrs Warren's lodger. She told us that the gentleman moved in ten days ago. Hmm? Now, be so good as to ask Mrs Hudson where she keeps the newspaper she uses for lighting the fires and try to retrieve as many gazettes as you can for the past fortnight. Well, what do you expect to find? We're on the trail of the elusive G, my dear fellow. The hunt is up. My boo? Is that you? Percy? Where are you? In here. In the kitchen. Whatever are you doing over this time of day? They haven't gone and give you the push, have they? Oh, oh Percy. Oh, my Lord. What, what's oh. happened? Where did you get that bruise on your forehead? You're covered in mud. I've been kidnapped, Mabel. That's what I've been. Kidnapped? Whatever do you mean? When? First thing after breakfast. Soon as I left the house. 
I hadn't gone ten paces down the road when two men come up behind me and threw a coat over me head. Oh. Then they bundled me into a cab standing at the curb. Outside the house? Why didn't you call out or something? I had this coat over me face. Half choking me, it was. Oh, Percy, whatever next? Well, next thing I knew, the driver whipped up the yeah. horse and we set off. Must have been going for an hour or more. Oh. Well, after a bit, I heard them muttering something. I, I couldn't make out the words. And all of a sudden, they oh. threw open the door and chucked me out. Oh. That's how I got this bruise. Oh, what a wicked thing. Yeah. You could have been... Yeah, well, when I when I picked myself up, I found I was at Hampstead Heath, and I had to make my own way home. Oh, well, I'm not going into work today, Mabel. Uh, yeah, you you must write and tell him I'm too shook up. Yeah, yes, all right, but but why should anyone do such a thing? How the hell should I know? Language, Percy. Well, I can tell you this much. It's got something to do with that perisher upstairs. I take me oath on it. What makes you say that? We've lived in this house 15 years and nothing like this ever happened before. Not till he moved in. I tell you, Mabel, he's got to go. Now then, my dear fellow, how many copies of the Gazette have you perused? Uh, Sixteen. Sixteen. Well mm. done. How many traces of our mysterious correspondent did you find? A one. Here. Signed, G. Did you come across any? Hmm. I was rather luckier. I bagged two. However, let us put them in chronological order. Yes. <laughs> yes, as you can see, this is the first one. Mm. Be patient. We'll find some means of communication. Meanwhile, this column, G. Yes, and that appeared two days after Mrs. Warren's lodger arrived, and then three days later... I'm making successful arrangements. Be patient, and the clouds will pass. Yes, nothing for a week after that. But then comes something rather more definite. Yes, the path is clearing. We'll try to signal message. Remember agreed code. You will hear very soon G. And this morning, the description of a high red house with white stone facings, third floor, second window left tonight. Yes, believe me, Watson, something is about to happen. Oh, Mr. Holmes. Something has happened. Oh. Come in, Mrs. Warren. We were just talking of you. Oh, I'm sorry to trouble you twice in one day. But you did say if anything else occurred. Ah, you have news for us. Oh, uh, won't you take a seat, madam? You're quite oh. out of breath. Uh, a glass of water, oh. perhaps. Hmm. Oh, no, thank you, sir. I've done nothing but traipse backwards and forwards all day. But me and Mr. Warren, we're not standing for no more of it. This is a police matter now, Mr. Holmes. Why? What's happened? Out he goes. Bag and baggage. I'd have gone straight up and told him so, only I thought it was only right to ask you first. But I'm at the end of my patience, and that's a fact. When he comes to knocking my old man about... Knocking your husband about? As good as. Used him very roughly, they did. They? Who? Oh, that's what we'd like to know. Mr Warren went off to work first thing, like he does every day. And the minute he left the house, two villains come up behind and kidnapped him. Good heavens. Threw a coat over his head and flung him into a cab, they did. They drove him all the way to Hampstead and chucked him out near the Vale of Elf. He's lucky to be alive. Did he see which way the cab went? Could he identify it? Oh, he was that shook up. He, he never thought to look. He just took a bus home, and he was there when I got back. Did he observe the appearance of the men or hear their conversation? He never saw nothing, nor heard nothing. Clean dazed he was, just as if he'd been lifted up and dropped again by magic. There was two men in it, he knows that much, three counting the driver. But why do you connect this attack with your lodger? Well, stands to reason, don't it? But we'll have him out of the house before the day's over, believe you me. Now, do nothing rash, Mrs Warren. It's clear that there's some danger threatening your lodger. His enemies were lying in wait at your door and ambushed your husband in error. On discovering their mistake, they let him go. Yes, what else they might have done, I can only conjecture. Well, that's all very well. But what are we to do, Mr Holmes? You know, I have a great fancy to see this lodger of yours, Mrs Warren. Well, I don't see how, unless you break his door down. After I leave his tray, I hear him unlock it as I go downstairs. He takes the tray in. Could we not conceal ourselves nearby and watch him do so? Let me think. There's a vacant room across the landing. I could fix up a looking glass, perhaps, 
And if you gentlemen was to stay behind the door... Yes, excellent. At what time does he take his evening meal? About seven, as a rule. Ah, very well. Dr Watson and I will be at Great Orme Street at a quarter two. Meanwhile, I rely on you to make the arrangements. Let's hope the gentleman hasn't requested an early supper this evening. Mm. Shall I ring the bell? Yes, but with finesse. We don't wish to disturb the entire household. Yeah, it seems a very respectable neighbourhood. Hardly the place one would expect to find this kind of thuggery. Of course, a street like this provides excellent cover. Tall residential buildings. Oh, hello. What now? A building across the road. No, 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 mm. further along. Don't you see? Huh? Nothing but a block of mansion flats, red brick... Exactly. Right. A high red house with white stone facings. That is the signal station. Shh. Someone's coming. Sorry to keep you waiting, gentlemen. I was just getting supper ready. Please come in. Watson, be so good as to remove your boots, if you please. My boots? Do as I do and leave them here by the hall stand. <laughs> Quarry is obviously on his guard. We must not alarm him. I'll take you upstairs, then I'll come down and wait till he rings for his supper. It shouldn't be long now. An excellent hiding place, giving us a good view of the door across the landing. I only wish the landlady had provided a larger mirror. It's difficult to see in such a small... At one moment. Yes, I thought so. By the smell of boiled cabbage and bacon, this will be Mrs. Warren with a tray. Your supper, sir. She's set down the tray. She's going downstairs. Yes, but look here. Oh, wait, I can... <gasps> I'll just close this door. <sighs> well, Watson, what do you make of that? Not a great deal. You were in the way. But I gather the lodger is a lady. A very beautiful one. Long, slim hands, the face of a Madonna, and a look of horror when she suspected she was being watched. She saw you? Uh, I think not. And there's a glimmer from the street lamp. She probably saw some faint movement which alarmed her. As I suspected, there's been a substitution of lodgers. But why? Well, consider this. A couple were seeking refuge from some terrible danger. The man, who had some essential work to carry out, wished to leave the woman in complete safety. He solved the problem so effectively that her presence was not even known to the landlady. The printed messages were in order to conceal her delicate feminine handwriting, and the man cannot now communicate with her except through the personal column of the Gazette. But what's behind it all? Some sort of elopement? A runaway romance. Oh, this is no love escapade. I fear it has a far more sinister aspect. The further we go in this investigation, the more curious and complex it becomes. Surely, Holmes, if it's some private matter, why should you pursue it any further? Oh, indeed. Oh, this is art for art's sake, my dear chap. But when you were in practice, did you never make any diagnosis without thought of reward? Mm, sometimes, for my education. Yes, well, education never ends, Watson. Life is an endless series of lessons, and this is an instructive case. Yes, there's neither money in it nor credit. Yet it's a case one would like to tidy up. Perhaps if we were to return to Baker Street and well, discuss... No, no, not yet. I remember this morning's message in the Gazette. The building over the road, hmm? Uh, let me see. The third floor, second window on the left. That apartment is in darkness. There seem to be no curtains at the window. Uh, this is evidently an empty flat to which our man has access. But he can't... Holmes! Look! Do you see that glimmer of light? Someone has lit a candle. Yes, and now he shields the flame with his hand. We must watch and wait. Now, I fancy he stands there, staring across at this house. No doubt he wishes to be sure that she is on the lookout, too. Yes, he removes his hand briefly, one flash of light, and he shields it again. Yes, that must be the code he referred to. A quick pencil and paper. One. What's it mean? Oh, there he goes again. One, two, three, four. Make a note of this, Watson. Mm -hmm. Seven, eight, and keep counting. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Mabel? Oh, what is it now? What do you think's going on up there? I don't know what to think, and that's a fact. But it's gone very quiet. Hmm. Quiet.
quiet as a grave. Oh, don't say such things. Hmm? At least he's stopped walking about. That's some comfort. Oh, it's me. He's biding his time. And what about them other two in the box room? They're biding their time too. You know what I wish? No. What? I wish we hadn't never started taking in lodgers. I wish we'd never come to Bloomsbury at all. I wish we'd stayed at home with me mum and dad at Tootin Beck. They don't have goings on like this in Tootin Beck. A most primitive form of code. One flash for A, two for B, three for C, and so on. Now, read it all out, Watson. Tell me what you have. A T T E N T A. Repeated three times. At ten, ta. Hmm. It doesn't make sense. Yes, unless T A are someone's initials. It could mean at ten, thank you, abbreviated to save time. No, no. I should have guessed from the dark beauty of that face. The word's Italian. Attenta, the Italian for beware. Look out! He's beginning again. One, two, three. Good lord! Total darkness. He's put out the candle. Yes, and the message has been cut short. By some intruder, perhaps? I think you're right. There's something devilish in this, Watson. We must go to that empty flat ourselves and see what we can find. There's still no light in that apartment. No sign of life. Uh, can you see anyone upstairs in Mrs. Warren's house at the lodger's window, perhaps? It has a net curtain, but yes, I can see the outline of a woman. She's standing there as we did, watching the building opposite. In that doorway, someone else is watching us. Mm -hmm. yeah, you see him by the light of that street lamp. Let's cross over. Why, Mr. Holmes? Inspector Gregson, this is a night of surprises. Well, well, and Dr. Watson. Journeys end in lovers' meetings, to coin a phrase. What brings you here, Inspector? Uh, the same reason that brings you, I dare say. Though how you got onto it, I can't imagine. Our different threads from the same tangled skein. The Doctor and I have been across the road, reading the signals. Signals? What signals? From the third floor window here, until the message was suddenly interrupted. That's why we came over, to see what's going on. However, since the case is in your good hands, Inspector, there's no point in our attempting to interfere, so we'll bid you a very good night. No, no, wait a bit. Don't run away, gentlemen. I'll say this much, Mr. Holmes. I was never on a case yet that I didn't feel the better for having you on my side. And there's no hurry. These flats only have the one exit, so we have him safely bottled up. And who is he? You mean to say you don't know? Well, we can score one over you for once, Mr. Holmes. See the cabman waiting at the corner? Mm -hmm. well, I'll get him over and introduce you. He can explain better than I can. A cab driver? That's right, Doctor. Except that he ain't a cab driver. Let me introduce you to Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. This is Mr. Leverton of Pinkerton's American Detective Agency. The hero of the Long Island Cave Mystery. I'm delighted to make your acquaintance. It's good of you to say so, Mr. Holmes. The honor's all mine. But I'm on the greatest trail of my life at present. If I can just lay my hands on Georgiano... Georgiano? Of the Red Circle? So his fame has spread this far, is it? Yet we know a good deal about him in the States, Mr. Holmes. He's at back of 50 unsolved murders. Yet he's so smart, we can't pin them on him. I trailed him here from New York, trying to find an excuse to lay my hand on his collar. But Inspector Gregson and I have run him to ground. He won't slip by us this time. Yes. Has no one come out of the building since you've been here? Uh, just one man. But Georgiano's built like a mountain. I'll take my oath it wasn't him. According to Mr. Holmes and the doctor, he was up there sending signals from the window. And he broke off suddenly. Hell's teeth! He's on to us! What makes you say that? Here he is, holed up in London, sending messages to an accomplice. We know there are several of his gang over in London. He must have caught sight of us down here in the street. Now what do we do? Well, I suggest we go up and investigate. We've got no warrant for his arrest. He's in unoccupied premises under suspicious circumstances. That's good enough for me. Okay. Let's go. We're on the third floor. But which door? Oh, this is the flat on the left-hand side. Bring your lantern over here, Inspector. 
Yeah, I thought as much. The door's ajar. He could be anywhere in the building by now. Yeah, maybe we should split up. Not Next. yet. First, let's make sure this flat's empty. Oh, this place is deserted. No furniture, no carpet. Uh, direct no. your lantern onto the floor, Gregson. <coughs> yes, thank you. Now you've got a trail of bloodstains leading to the front room. Follow me. By George! Will you look at that? Black Georgiano himself. Someone got to him ahead of us. Quite so. And on the windowsill, someone's left half a candle and a box of matches. Well, what the dickens are you doing, Holmes? The man's dead, with a knife in his throat. Yes, yeah, so I observed. A veritable giant of a man. It must have been a formidable blow. I know doubt he tried to defend himself. You noticed the dagger lying close to his hand. So this is the man you were after? Yeah, was. Uh, you say a man emerged from the building while you stood guard below. Did you observe him closely? Of course. Was he a man of about 30, dark, middle-sized, with a black beard? Uh, yes, it was. You didn't recognise him? No, I never saw him before in my life. Why? Yes, possibly he didn't have a beard when he lived in New York. It's no matter. I've given you his description, and you now have an excellent outline of his footprint in that pool of blood. That red circle. Ah, you've mentioned the red circle before. What does it mean? It's the name of a secret society in Naples, allied to the old Carbonari, an infernal brotherhood of crime and corruption which extends from Italy to London and to America. Isn't that so, Mr. Leverton? Right. The oaths and secrets of the Red Circle are terrible. Yet once a man gets into the power of the brotherhood, there's no escape. And this... this black Georgiano, what sort of a man was he? Black-hearted. His hands red with the blood of his victims. In Italy, he earned the name of death. He had to leave Naples in a hurry to avoid arrest. When he reached New York, he set up a new chapter of the organization. Thank God that death has caught up with him at last. That's all very well, but who killed him? I can't tell you his name, but you have his description, his footprint. That should be enough for you, surely. It's not much to go on, Mr. Holmes. Among all the millions in London... No, perhaps not. That's why I thought it might be best to summon this lady to assist you. Please come in, Signora. What the...? You have killed him. My husband, you have killed I him. I think not. Look again, Signora. Oh! Dio mio, it is Giorgiano. Oh, Signor, this is wonderful. The most wonderful. But I do not understand. You are police, is it not so? You have killed Giorgiano. But where is Gennaro? Where is my husband? I must ask you to identify yourself, madam. You are... I know this lady. She is Mrs. Amelia Luca, the wife of Gennaro Luca, Italian immigrants living in New York. But where is Gennaro? He called me this moment from the window and I ran here with all speed. It was I who called you, Signora, using the flame of that candle. You? Well, how could you call? Well, the code was not difficult. I knew I only had to send the word, Vieni, and you would surely come. How do you know these things? Oh, that evil man, Giorgiano. How did he... Oh, oh now I see it. My Gennaro, my beautiful Gennaro, who has guarded me and kept me safe. Oh, thank God. It was he who killed this monster. Excuse me, madam. I'm still not quite clear what's been going on, but I must ask you to accompany me to Scotland Yard. Now, uh, one moment, Gregson. Uh, I fancy this lady may be as anxious to give us information as you are to hear it. Now, uh, you understand, Signora, that your husband may be arrested and tried for the death of the man who lies before us. But if you believe he acted from the highest possible motives, you cannot serve him better than by telling us the whole story. Oh, now Giorgiano is dead. We fear nothing. Oh, Signor Leverton, you must tell them. Giorgiano was a devil. No judge in the world will punish my husband for having killed him. I'll do all I can. Then I suggest that we leave this apartment as we found it. Put a man on guard, Inspector. And let's escort this lady to her own room and hear what she has to tell us. Well, madam? I was born in Posilipo, near Naples. Gennaro was in my father's employment and we fell in love. He had no money and no prospects. Nothing but his strength, his goodness, and his beauty. 
and my father forbade the match. So we eloped. We were married in Bari. I sold my jewels and we purchased tickets to sail to New York. How long ago was this? Four years. At first, fortune smiled upon us. Gennaro was able to do some service to a wealthy businessman, uh, uh, Mr. Castle. He saved him from an attack by some ruffians in a place they call the Bowery. Uh, you know it? I know it only too well. Uh, Clifford Castle is the senior partner of Castle and Zambra, the chief fruit importers in New York City. Out of gratitude, Castle took Gennaro Luca under his wing. He was very good. He gave my husband work in his office and soon made him head of his department. We were able to take a little house in Brooklyn. Our future was full of promise. Until the day your husband ran into Giuseppe Giorgiano. He was like a black cloud shutting out the sun. And he soon covered the whole sky. Senor, don't distress yourself. Uh, please continue, Mr. Leverton. Like I said, we were already keeping tabs on the man. The Italian police had made contact and warned us about him. After that, we had him tailed wherever he went, and one of the places he went was the Lucas house in Brooklyn. He used to come and visit us. I could not understand why my Gennaro, who was so good, could befriend such an evil man. I asked him many times, but he would not discuss it. Until one evening, soon after he had come home from the office... The doorbell rang. When I opened the door, Signor Lerverton walked in. Mrs. Luca? Yes? Is your husband home? Why, yes, he is, but... I who are... want a word with him. Ah, there you are, Mr. Luca. Who are you, huh? What do you want? The name's Leverton, from Pinkerton's Detective Agency. I'm making inquiries in connection with a fellow countryman of yours, Giuseppe Giorgiano. I, I know nothing about him. Oh, but Gennaro... I do not know the man. I hate to have to disagree with you, sir, but you were seen with him in a bar on Bleecker Street not more than an hour ago. I need to know what business you discussed with him. I do not understand. Emilia, please. When I say I don't know him, I mean I hardly know him. He comes from my home district in Italy, and he likes to talk about old times. That is all. I do not do any business with him. Is that so? And what can you tell me about the Red Circle, Mr. Luca? I can tell you nothing. I know nothing of the Red Circle or about this man. I've done nothing wrong. Now stop asking me questions and get out of my house. When Mr. Leverton had gone, I begged Gennaro to tell me the truth. I put my arms about him because I saw he was afraid. A deep secret fear. And at last, he told me everything. We know Giorgiano was one of the Red Circle leaders. I suppose your husband is a member of the Brotherhood? Oh, not anymore. At home in Naples, in his young days, when he was wild and rebellious, he had joined the organization. But he soon realized he had made a terrible mistake. When we fled to America, he thought he had cast it off forever. Then he met Giorgiano again who began to blackmail him and tried to involve him in criminal activities. Gennaro showed me a paper he had thrust into his hand that very day, with a red circle upon it. It was an order to attend a meeting. If he disobeyed, he would be killed. Oh, he should have told me. We could have protected him. Oh, there was no protection against such a man. And if anything happened to Gennaro, I would have been left alone, penniless in a foreign land. Worse still... More than once, Giorgiano had tried to force his attentions upon me. He made no secret of the fact that he found me attractive. Oh, without Gennaro, I would become a helpless victim. We both knew that. So, your husband obeyed the command. He attended the meeting? He did. That night he was very late in returning. I feared for his life. When he came home, it was almost midnight... But he was not alone. Come in, sir. You know my wife. Mr. Cass. Of course. A very great pleasure, ma'am. Oh, how do you do? Forgive me, I am in my dressing gown. I was not expecting... And neither was I. But your husband was most insistent when he telephoned and asked me to meet him here. Oh. Now then, my friend. What's all this about, huh? Sit down, please. Both of you. Mr. Castle. I believe you have recently met an Italian by the name of Giuseppe Giorgiano. That man, I knew it. If it is bad news, I knew that he would be involved in it. Well, I've met him, yes. But I'm sorry to hear he's an acquaintance of yours. He came to my home a few weeks back and tried to blackmail me. Oh, no. It seems he's the ringleader of some gang. 
He goes around threatening successful businessmen with violence unless they pay him money. Protection money, he calls it. Yes, this I knew already. But you did not agree. I most certainly did not. Uh, I said if I heard any more of this nonsense, I would go directly to the police. It is a great pity you did not do so. Huh? Tonight, the Red Circle held a meeting. I was forced to attend it. They resolved to make an example of you, sir, as a warning to future victims. It was agreed that you and your home should be blown up by dynamite. Oh, dear me, you must go to the police ah, at once. Wait, wait, there is more to tell. We drew lots as to who should carry out the deed. And I saw Giorgiano smile at me as I dipped my hand into the bag. Somehow, he had fixed it. When I drew out my slip of paper, I saw, well, here it is. The Red Circle. It was a clever plan. If I obeyed, you, my benefactor, would be a dead man, and I would be wanted for murder and hounded by the police. If I refused, the Brotherhood would kill me at once. To save my life, I had to pretend to go along with it. Dear God, what are we to do? There is only one way. Tomorrow, you must go to the police and tell them all you know. It is all the evidence they need to arrest Giorgiano. But what about you? Uh, by this time tomorrow, Emilia and I will be on our way to London. And safety. But the plan misfired and Giorgiano slipped through our fingers. He managed to escape and followed you to England, intent on revenge. The rest of the story we already know. Signor Luca made arrangements for his wife to live here secretly and safely, but he could only communicate with her through the newspaper until tonight. And now I ask you, gentlemen, do we have anything to fear from the law? Would any law on earth condemn my husband for what he has done? That is up to the law to decide, madam, not me. But I'm sure Mr. Holmes will use his influence on your husband's behalf. It wouldn't be the first time. I don't know what your British judges will have to say, but in New York... I guess Gennaro Luca will have a pretty general vote of thanks. I think we may indeed take an optimistic viewpoint. We all saw that Giorgiano was armed with a dagger. It's clear enough that your husband killed him in self-defense. Huh. I don't think you've much to fear, madam. Oh, thank you, signor. What I still don't understand, Mr. Holmes, is how on earth you got yourself mixed up in all this. Education, Gregson, education. Still seeking knowledge at the old university. Hmm. Well, Watson, we must be on our way. We have another appointment this evening. I fear we're already late. Another appointment? Do we? Certainly. Do you think you could waylay a hansom, my dear fellow? This other appointment you referred to. I don't recollect anything about it. Oh, I'm sorry. Didn't I tell you? Yes, we have another call upon our time, I fear. At an address somewhere in Covent Garden. Really? What's it all about? A mysterious murder, Watson. A crime of jealous passion and revenge. An Italian stabbed to death. Another one? I have the necessary documents here in my pocket. Perhaps you'd care to take charge of them. Theatre tickets? The Opera House, my dear chap. Rigoletto. With a bit of luck, we should be in time for the second act. In The Red Circle, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Merrison and Dr. Watson by Michael Williams, with Joan Sims as Mrs. Warren and Ronald Herdman as Inspector Gregson. Mr. Warren was played by James Taylor, Emilia Luca by Una Beeson, Gennaro Luca by Lyndon Gregory, James Leverton by Dominic Letts, and Cyrus Castle by Philip Antony. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Red Circle was dramatised for radio by Peter Ling, and directed by Enid Williams.